mental health while we're on this journey in grad school. So I'm, going to, I'm showing you the data that even led to my participating in this talk. So a recent report by UC Berkeley shows that 47% of graduate students have some mental health concerns. And that is a whooping one in two PhD students. And that calls for. Also, uh, a brother study by Evans and some of his co-workers, and his co-workers, sorry, shows that graduate student, 41% of graduate students experience anxiety and 39% experience depression. And when you compare this to the general population, this is six times higher or six times more prevalent in grad school than the general public. So looking at this data, a good question that you might ask is, what are the factors that contribute to this such a prevalence of mental health among grad students? And when I searched through literature, I found out that much uh, of the factors that have been identified is the research environment. Where graduate students often experience this published or perish culture. And even some of the uncertainties that often be cloud our mind, like career uncertainties, life in grad school, job opportunities for us. And for graduate students, which I am a part of, and I can tell you for sure I've experienced this, is the culture shock. And some of the forms of discrimination and harassment have also been highlighted. And looking at you can see that it was a, I want to appeal to you that if your particular struggle is not represented here, that doesn't make it less unreal or less valid. It just keeps going on. And also a look at this shows that most of these factors are systemic. That tells us we may not have a direct control over this, but we can focus on one thing, to empower ourselves and to seek help. Then the question is, what can you do as a graduate student going through some mental health issues? So one of the biggest challenges uh, of uh, people struggling with mental health is even recognizing the need for help. So I put on this uh, mental health continuum to show you that our mental health fluctuates over time. And you can go from flourishing, sorry, you can go from flourishing at some point to languishing, which is the red, uh, the red part of the arrow. So whenever you notice some uh, deviation from your normal attitude or your normal way of life, I think it's the right time to act. And to act would mean to speak up. Always remember that when you're able to share your concerns or your uh, struggles with people, that's the only way you can get the necessary help. Also, rather than going into isolation, it would be nice. It's uh, it's it would be nice to seek support from friends, from your PI, or from even the online space. You never know. There might be people going through exactly the same thing as you are, and they are willing to give you help. Uh, we can say that we don't have that luxury of time in grad school. It's a good investment to, uh, devote, your, to devote yourself to some physical, emotional, or social self-care routines just to avoid being burned out. It's a long journey and we need to be here for it. And whenever you notice changes that last for several weeks and start affecting your routine, please, that is the right time to seek for help. Um, I think it would be proper to also look at some of the symptoms you see, because I keep saying it's the right time to ask for, to ask for help. I think this is good to see what symptoms you could experience and what actions you need to take at every point in time. Just as an example, when your mood starts going from the normal and then you start having some panic attacks, you see that it's not going to bed. And then that is when you would need some professional care. So ask yourself, where am I on this continuum? Am I tending towards the, uh, the green or towards the red? Then that determines the action you would take at each point. And then I thought about what can we do as graduate students for other graduate students? And Lozell in his 2020 publication has a perfect answer. It shows that overall 81% of PhD students have supported PhD students. And we also have received support from postdocs and our professors. So what does that tell us? We ourselves are a greater contributing factor to ensuring 
the mental health for one another. We need to look out for one another. That would range from active listening to emotional support, focusing for someone else, or even suggesting resources that might be relevant to, to our, our hope students. And then to be that think, sorry, talk and do project student, I'm putting up the resources just to remind us that these are available in NCSU, both on campus and off campus. And we can take our, leverage them or make use of them whenever we go through any mental health concern. To summarize this talk, I want you to know that mental ill health doesn't mean you being weak. Don't beat up yourself and say, maybe it's just me not trying hard enough. Mental health is not your way of avoiding hard work. I want you to shut those voices in your head and tell yourself that mental health is not your fault. It's an illness that deserves as much compassion as every other physical illness that with my experience. And you need to speak up to get the need, to get the help that you need. Thank you so much. Do we have any comments or questions for Chiamaka? All right, one last round of applause for Chiamaka, please. All right, um, that is our last sign up for Wisdom Talks. So you won't see these uh, for a while unless he else signs up. Um, if these have been important to you, if they've made an impact on you, I implore you to try. Um, I just want to give an example real quick of, um, I had a graduate student reach out to me um, and ask if they could just talk to somebody. Um, and I, of course, said yes and stepped outside with them. Um, and they came out as bi and they were like, nobody else knows. Um, I got permission to share this. <laughs> um, um, and I was able to, you know, reinforce to them that there's a community here that cares for them and that supports them, um, connected them to the GLBT Center and all that stuff. Um, it, it, it matters, um, even if it's just for one person. Um, it, it's had a really big impact so far. Um, so I know, and I've gotten a lot of like, oh, but I'm too scared. It's, it's so terrifying. And I think everybody here saw how awkward it was when I was here and I just could deer in headlights and froze and yeah, I, I know it's terrifying, but did, did I combust into flame? No, did it feel like it? Yes, but it was, it was worth it. And um, it's, it's worth a shot. So um, yeah, uh, if so signing up is great motivation because then it's like you have to do it and then you have to come up with something. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't want these to die. I think, I think they're really important. So uh, yeah, I hope we get to hear another one. So thank you all very much. I'll pass this on to Jim who's gonna introduce our Very good, thank you. And thank you, Chimaka, for uh, uh, stepping up and, and speaking out. Uh, and to everybody, to you and everybody. Um, you know, sometimes as grad students, you feel like, oh my gosh, I have all this kind of stress. And sometimes we faculty help create some of that stress. But if my experience is like anybody's, we live it too. Uh, so you're not weird if you feel like, oh my gosh, I've got all the stress, anxiety, and mental health issues. Because guess what? We live it too. Um, and um, a, a lot of us are willing to have that conversation. So if we can help uh, reach out, let us be part of that network. But, but thank you for highlighting the issues. Uh, and thanks for, to everybody who's done these wisdom talks. I think it's, it's uh, uh, really important for us to you know, recognize we're human. We're not just these technocrats uh, in the lab, but uh, I think the wisdom talks help bring out humanity. So thank you. All right, today um, is a special seminar. Uh, we have started hosting these DEI seminars twice a year. Work of your DEI committee. If you don't know more about what's going on and would like to, uh, please reach out and let, let some of us know. Um, would all members of the DEI committee please 
identify yourselves so people, if you have any questions, talk to us and get engaged. Okay, so there's a bunch of us. Um, reach out if you'd like to know more uh, uh, how to get engaged in the department to create a effective, diverse, uh, equitable, and inclusive environment. Well, today's speaker uh, is Dr. Benny Chan. Uh, he is currently a professor and chair of the chemistry department at the College of New Jersey. I didn't know it before he came, but we're, uh, I guess we're scientific cousins. Um, uh, so uh, Benny did his PhD uh, at Penn State with Tom Malouk, uh, solid state chemist, and then went on to do his postdoctoral work uh, at Colorado State working with Peter Dorhout. And Peter and I were uh, close scientific colleagues, have been scientific colleagues for quite a while. So Peter and I are sort of brothers, so I guess that makes you my cousin or something like that. Uh, but he also worked with Ryan Hess. Uh, he was doing some of his work at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Ryan was my very first undergraduate uh, research student. Uh, and so it's kind of fun uh, to see that come around. And so that's it. Actually, you have a connection to NC State. Um, anyhow, um, Benny joined the faculty at the College of New Jersey in 2006. He's an American Chemical Society fellow and has been recognized by the National Organization of Gay and Lesbian Scientists and Technical Professionals as Educator of the Year in 2019. He's a recipient of the 2023 TNJ Innovative Teaching Award for creating a new model for teaching general chemistry and that has re resulted in improved student outcomes, uh, especially for BI, uh, BIPOC and low-income students. He's designate, he's designed, piloted, and refined the model, uh, which is now a standard uh, to their teaching, and I think he's going to tell us some about that today. Benny, welcome. Hopefully this will stick on here. Okay, awesome. So thank you everyone for, for, for joining me today and inviting me down uh, for this talk. Okay, so uh, thinking about these wisdom talks, you know, it's really well to talk about some of these kinds of things on here. It gets easier the more you do it. Uh, uh, so I encourage you to do it. As chemistry undergrads, none of us are trained in these kind of conversations. I've had zero training in anything that I've done here, um, including what I talked about yesterday. So you can learn it. So please take some time to really uh, jump in and do some of these kinds of activity uh, in there. It does help you in a long uh, term career. So, uh, and I've built an entire career talking about things that are going on in the wisdom. Today's mental health is really important. I saw myself in all those graduate school. When I finished graduate school, I only did my postdoc because I wanted to go skiing. Absolutely nothing else. I really didn't care about the science at all. And then Peter was actually able to turn me back on to science. And uh, all my volunteer work with ACS is dealing with these kind of topics. So I'm going to talk about some of my uh, the research that we've been doing at TCNJ on uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. So I'm going to add the justice on there um, because we do want to think about this as a social justice issue uh, in terms of what we're doing in the classrooms and thinking about it. A lot of the data that I'm going to talk about is pre-pandemic, but it's actually helped my department not only adjust to the pandemic, but also thrive in the pandemic um, because we were developing models to think about students uh, and student perceptions and interactions throughout our work. So it became part of the culture of what we were doing uh, in here. So we developed a model uh, for this kind of work, and we're still working on the Gen Chem paper uh, that's going to come out of this um, that we hope to get out soon, but of course we're busy uh, with stuff. So let me go back it, it, with a fundamental uh, question here. And one of the biggest concerns in STEM education comes from this kind of data. And I'm going to show you these dirty laundry. My dean hates it when I talk about these kinds of things and show this data. However, as an institution, NC State, I'm sorry, is no different. Your data looks exactly like ours. So it doesn't really matter where we do. So the biggest thing is if we go ahead and look at TCNJ first year students, this is back in 2016, way before the pandemic, we can see in terms of the DFW rate. So that's when a student receives a DF or W. So that extends graduation time period uh, for students. So, um, and then also waste of resources. 
the Black and Latinx students are trailing behind our white Asian. So there is an issue that we can see from the data. Every single institution has some sort of data that shows this somehow. It, and it's how we kind of divide this. And of course, everybody says, this isn't my institution, this isn't my department. But if we go ahead and dive in, we see the data comes from our chemistry and biology. If we look at something like math SAT scores, we can see Black and Latinx students don't do as well as the other students. Uh, in there. So we are now SAT optional in there, but if you just change this to what math course they get placed into, data is exactly the same. So even without the SAT to measure, we can look at where the math placement is and see where these get these, these kinds of um, percentages that don't graduate. Uh, you know, we want to see some sort of equity uh, in, in our education. So how we name and frame this phenomenon is extraordinarily important. If you look at the literature, they always talk about persistent achievement gap between various demographic groups. What are we saying here? When we actually think about it and say that there's achievement gaps, that means who's the problem? The students are the problem. And then that, creates a difference between the various demographic groups, then it creates an us versus them attitude. You know, so what are we gonna do here? So this is the most common way folks are framing this problem and thinking about it. So it is problematic in terms of thinking. And so I wanted to go through a couple of definitions uh, for folks um, that, that's looking at science education reform. So equality is a state. So we want to think about that as a state, um, you know, where you're just kind of sitting. And what we're doing is we're looking at things that are equal. So when are things equal for other folks in here? Equity is a different kind of concept. It's an action. It's something that we are going to do uh, with this. And then we want to, in equity, we want to change the learning environment in terms of how we're thinking about uh, providing the support to the students who need it. Uh, the most, while minimizing the cost to other students. So we do have to think about the cost of some of the equity uh, questions on here. So lots of schools, lots of institutions will talk about equality and equity. Um, but where is justice in all of this? So what do we do to actually create justice? Uh, can you guys Before hear me? Go ahead and think about this. Benny, can you hear me? This. Um, I don't think your screen, your screen is being shared. I tried to do this in the chat, but nobody's responding. I'm going to reframe this kind of question. What does educational debt actually mean? And I'm not talking about all the student loan debt that we're talking about, because I know that's all over social media. And I know you want to keep your, your student loans, you know, as low as possible. At least in chemistry, you are paid to be here. You know, it's not a lot, but you are paid to be here, uh, to, uh, which is very different than other schools. The educational debt that I want to frame this problem in now Okay, educational debt is this foregone conclusion that we as society have under-resourced schools since the beginning of time. So there's been an uh, unequal distribution of funding for schools, primarily low-income kids, um, and that leads to a deficit that actually creates a lot of the problems, social problems that we see. That include things like crime, low productivity. I was talking to somebody today who comes from a rural area, you know, that's where the opioid and the fentanyl crisis is coming from. All those kinds of things are coming from this educational debt model. So at some point, and this is the kinds of stuff that I like thinking about. We have to pay back that debt. We have to pay back what, you know, what was owed to these folks that haven't been able to um, participate in the, the world because we have not given funding to school. So all of a sudden, we want to think about this in terms of educational debt. Now it is an us problem, not a student problem. The people that are controlling education systems are the ones who need to pay back this educational debt. 
It is my responsibility as a faculty member, is a responsibility of my department, my institution, to pay back this debt. Because we don't want to think about it as, oh, we're just going to fix this one student. Because we need to fix the system and fix the system quickly. Um, and not to say that, you know, some of these equity programs are not important, they are important. Um, but, you know, we should be looking at systems level kinds of solutions. So what does this look like at TCNJ? We all know uh, math is really important for science degrees. And this is um, interview data that has come back from our students. Uh, the only time and the essential thing that comes out from this interview data, the only time I really learned anything in math was junior year, junior year of high school. And so what does a systemic oppression look like um, at TCNJ? So at first year, uh, they learned some stuff and then a teacher was transferred. So if you think about us, uh, you know, place an urban school, you know, the teacher just left, burnout, whatever reason they did, then they got a substitute. Learning is gone at that point. Sophomore year, they had a teacher that only cared about the park. So that's our statewide testing system that, that determines all the funding for the school district. So all the teachers, all they do is teach you everything that's on the test. So we just want to think about that. So they didn't learn anything new. They were just re uh, reviewing anything. Uh, junior year, they had an okay professor. I was kind of curious to see why they called the teacher a professor. Like typically when you're in high school, you think that as a teacher. But um, he taught us and had a high pace. And then senior year, this student didn't take any math because that pre-calculus class was the last math that they could even take at TCMJ or at their high school. And this is a first generation Latino math major. Think about that. Somebody coming in as a math major hadn't taken any math since junior year because they didn't have anything left. This student is at a major disadvantage when you think about what's happening here. Was it the student's fault that any of this happened? No, it was not their fault. But what can we do to kind of fix it and kind of think about it? So that's what it kind of looks like. Um, and that's the kind of work that we do at TCNJ is we think about the student stories and how do we amplify student stories and student perspectives on here. So I want to think about graduation in STEM. Uh, and here, so we're starting off, you know, since the And the question we like to ask is, what is an appropriate barrier for, you know, to get graduate in STEM? Of course, there should be some appropriate barrier. Do you think a person should graduate with a chemistry degree without being able to do stoichiometry calculations? Probably not. You need to be able to do stoichiometry. You need to be able to do lots of other kinds of reactions. I'm thinking, you know, I teach inorganic chemistry. You know, um, is group theory critical for graduation? For some people it is, some people it isn't. It depends, kind of thinking about it. So what are appropriate graduation uh, barriers? So we should have some appropriate barriers in there, uh, in there uh, because we want students. So when students have some sort of disadvantage, uh, in here, some sort of background issue. It looks kind of like this. You know, there's a little bit of barrier success. Sometimes you can get over it, sometimes you can't. So we want to kind of think about it and um, look at it. But what if a student has multiple barriers because of their different identities? So what if they're dealing with racism in the classroom and an underfunded school district and a school district that didn't have any math? Those barriers pile up on top of each other but a student who is facing that can't differentiate whether they're feeling racism, sexism, uh, you know, underfunded math uh, skills. They can't determine that. So it just looks like a barrier. And that's why students don't come to our office hours. They're just seeing a barrier uh, in there, and then they're trying to fix it uh, at some point. And if a student happens with a lot of Institutional, uh, institutionalized or systemic issues, this is what the barrier looks like. What does the student do when they see this? What was that? What? Yeah, they do a lot of crying. Do they actually, do they finish their degree? They probably don't finish their degree. You know, sometimes they, you know, I'm hoping 
at least finish a college degree. That's still a success in my book. Students from a marginalized background, finishing with a college degree is still good. But a student sees all this and they're probably gonna leave step. It's too much. It is too much to do that. So what can we do to lower as many of these barriers? And this is where social justice comes in. So we wanna think about removing these barriers and making sure that a student can flourish in our departments with while attach, attack it, uh, you know, attacking these appropriate kind of barriers. So let's think about this. And I like this model much better. I've seen this like as a leaky pipeline model. Bullshit. <laughs> it's terrible kind of model. Because you know, it, it, it indicates, you know, those drips that are on the floor that they're failure in there. They're not failures. They just, you know, it's just a different kind of tra trajectory uh, in there. So when we think about this. Um, we need to do some change. Change is ridiculously hard. Um, I know we, we've had lots of conversations of change today at lunch, and it, it's really hard. It's hard to institutionalize it. It's hard to put for it. People are tired, but we need the support of each other uh, to work through it. So we have developed this kind of uh, change model that at TCNJ on how we're trying to interact with our student population as our demographics are going to change, not just now, but they're always gonna change. Our students are always gonna change. Right now, everybody has an iPhone. I don't know what's gonna happen with chat GPT, all the AI writing, all that. That is going to change education again. So we have to think about these kind of emerging technologies, emerging innovation, how that's gonna change us. But why don't we come up with a model to think about these kinds of things? So that we are ever adapting to the world around us, particularly faculty. And I know I have faculty that haven't changed their notes in 30 or 40 years. The general chemistry lab that I teach now is the same one we had back in 1980. It's the same one I did when I was an undergrad. You know, so we have to think about it. So, um, you know, change is hard. What does it look like um, in here? So what we have decided to do at TCNJ is what we call a theory of change. So a theory of change actually um, honors the fact that learning and education and higher education is extraordinarily complex. There is a lot of different variables. Of, there's many causes that lead to stu the, the students not being successful. Most of those causes have some sort of correlation with each other. And we really focus on how and why all of these causes are interrelated to each other. That's very different than our training as a scientist. How many variables are you supposed to change when you do an experiment? One, all right? And so that's what most of the science education literature focus on. Let's make one change. From a faculty member's point of view, that was a failed experiment. But was it actually failed? It probably wasn't because we are not honoring this complex system uh, in there. So part of it is also thinking about this. And we broke this down just a little bit in our theory of change. We looked at our cause and, uh, causes and the effects. And this rings very true to what chemists do. We look at mechanisms. So thinking about your organic chemistry, we're thinking about why things, why the electrons are being pushed around. And then we can kind of think about, you know, where we think about learning and what can we design an intervention? Can we design some sort of catalytic process to change that mechanism? Because that's what a catalyst actually does. It changes the mechanism in there so you can affect the outcome of this. So can we design intervention sites? Uh, for this. And it's not just about designing one intervention. Everybody is looking for the silver bullet. I wish I could tell you what the silver bullet, but all of you are complex. We are complex. That means we need multiple solutions to do that. And that's the kind of approach that we've been using at TCNJ to force change. And, you know, we're doing this change at the institutional level, not just in my department, not just in our school. All of this was piloted in my department and our school of science. And now we're trying to push this out to the entire school 
I can't tell you how many talks I've been giving to humanities and social science folks on the same kind of stuff um, because they want to learn too and kind of how to think about change. So we developed um, the, our theory of change called the experimentalist teacher. And so what we want to do is honor the fact that we are scientists and fundamentally as chemists, we are experimentalists. Um, this is a little bit different than the math folks because the math folks will sit there and they will stick around in the theory sections forever and never actually get to practice. Like I'm a synthetic inorganic chemist. Just mix the freaking things together and see what the outcome is. Does your color change? Do you get a precipitate? Does something happen? Just freaking do the experiment. Don't think about the theory too much. Just go ahead and do it. So we want to go ahead and think about the experimentalist mindset for this theory of change. And it's built on three different pillars because all good things come in threes um, on here. And our first pillar is to gain a real empathy and understanding of our students and where they come from. What is their context? What is their voice in terms of, of what's going on in their lives? So we do a lot of this work uh, in here. Of course, as scientists, we want to make data-informed choices. So we can pull data after data like I already showed you uh, in here. We can get things like DFW rates. We can link that to graduation rates. We can link that to information like race, gender, sexual orientation, and see what all those effects are there. And every time I pull that data, everybody's like, oh my God, there's a problem here. But it doesn't tell our faculty and our administrators what to do. So the numbers are not enough on here. So that is where we end up pulling in the social sciences. The social sciences are really good at looking at social systems and how they work together, how power plays together uh, in here. And I've developed a very close, and she's one of my best friends on campus, Dr. Lynn Gaisley. Um, she and I uh, collaborate on almost all these projects, and she kind of helps. Um, if you've ever taken a sociology or psychology class, there's a lot in them. They're really dense. They keep naming all these names that I've never heard of before, um, and it's really challenging. So she helps to, to kind of work through a lot of this uh, literature, fundamental literature, and how this is there. How does this work? But the biggest skill that, that comes from Lynn Gaisley uh, and her research group is that she can be interviewed and actually code all the interview data and find trends in an interview. That is not my skill set. I can barely use Excel to calculate averages and, 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 and all these plots. Um, you know, but she can actually go through this data. And she's been actually training me on how to conduct interviews how to code data, how to pull information, and look at the trends that we're seeing. And you already saw a little bit of the outcome with that, you know, what does systemic oppression look like for a first-generation math major? Uh, what does that actually look like uh, for that? Because once we know what things look like, we are better enough to design intervention for those kinds of information. So this is the power of qualitative data. And this is a, a so we collect all this data. We have probably about 3,000 hours worth of interview data on here. And she's, in her, she's analyzed this with a research student. So this experience is extraordinarily common for first-generation college students. So first of all, studying wasn't a thing in high school. Like, so we had a summer program that we're helping to gather all this data and help students. So it's one of those interventions that is designed to fix the student uh, kind of solution. But we gathered information from the students. So I learned how to study here in the summer program, because like I said in high school, I didn't really need to study at all, like at all. And what this ends up leading to is a grade shock experience. In my fir at first day, I was like, okay, I'm ready. This is college, let's go. And I got hit like a ton of bricks. My first quiz grade was like a 55, and I was like, what, what the heck? And I think that's when I got my reality check. Does this sound familiar with a lot of our students? First time they get a crappy grade, ever. Because most of the students that are coming to TCNJ 
Um, even if they're in this kind of first generation marginalized background, they were valedictorian, top five of their school. They've never experienced this. When a teacher told them, you know, uh, you need to do X, Y, Z, it was always wah, 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 wah. That was for that person over there, never for me. All right. And so lots of, all, every single student in our program led to this, except for one or two. And they, that's because of some other weird, like the one kid had like a whole programming class already. So that was a little bit weird situation, a um, little different. Um, but then the students that, so what we can do with the qualitative data is look at their grades and link it back to the interviews and see who are the students that actually were able to succeed all of a sudden, the students that were able to make a connection to studying, oh my God, studying helped. Like for this student, this is an important realization that studying can change things. Like I really got to study if I want to pass the class. But it's not, and our data also shows it's not just about making a connection to studying, but also making a change to the study. So thinking about your studying like a scientist. I'm going to develop a hypothesis. I'm going to go ahead and make that change, and I'm going to assess whether that change has actually helped. So the students, you know, that were successful in our program were able to do these four steps. And as a professor, I'm like, well, duh. Of course, this is what you should be doing. However, it didn't show up in terms of, you know, am I actually going to make a student do these kinds of things? So am I going to make a student go through this process that we know is successful? For them? So can we use this experience to design interventions to manufacture great shock? Like I kill them on their first quiz <laughs> on purpose because I want them to feel them. And then make this connection and I help them through that uh, kind of process um, and working through them. So, you know, this is really kind of the qualitative data piece. So our next pillar that's really important, and um, we need to make a change toolkit of our acceptable pedagogy. Um, and we need to treat our teaching like research. So we need to think about this acceptable pedagogy piece because I take stuff, you know, I, I know my department, we go to things like the BCCE, which is the, the, the Chemistry Education Conference. We bring back all these ideas. Uh, we bring external speakers in there to help uh, talk to us. First thing is uh, that school came from an R1. So we're a PUI institution. Like that person is in a 200 person classroom. That work doesn't apply to me every single time. Or the work was done at a PUI that had 30 students. That can't be done on our level. So you have to figure out, and our school and department had to figure out what are the acceptable pedagogy that works for us? And we had to go through that process and kind of think about um, what, what is able. So this is when we started to think more systematically and more about interventions on, on grade shock. And really the mechanism for this grade shock uh, or thinking about it is that students don't reflect on their learning experience. They have not developed any type of metacognition skills on learning how to learn. Why? Because for our students in our most marginalized populations, never had to. They go to class, look at their little study sheet for 10 minutes, and get you know, nearly 100% exams. But that's not what we're testing. We're not testing that superficial piece on there. And what we want to do is we want to get better coping and study skills. So what can we do to de design these interventions? It's not just one thing that we do. We try to do lots of different interventions to help get through this grade shock. So thinking about things about making things explicit, like reading the textbook. I talked with a lot of faculty today, students don't know how to read textbooks at all. Like they don't even have textbooks right now. It was pieced together on a bunch of PDFs that were copy and pasted from web pages. They don't know how to read a textbook. They don't even know that there's end of the chapter problems on there because they've never seen them before. So, you know, kind of thinking about what activities are ex uh, expected for success. And then we started making things like post-exam quizzes, reflection, and not just making it available, making it required. All students are required to do it because we also know that the students that are suffering the most won't do these activities unless they're made to do it. 
So does this add a little bit of workload? Yes, it does. Is that appropriate? I think so, if you actually want them to progress through this metacognition model um, and making sure everybody has access or not just access, that everybody is doing the same kind of activities uh, with us. And what we also, what we're really thinking about is metacognition and self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is this idea that I have the power to actually make changes in my study habits and change the outcome of my, uh, you know, my school. So we're thinking carefully about these kind of interventions on here um, to address these issues on here. So our final pillar is, is how, you know, this is great and we see this happen at many institutions. It's like two or three faculty members are making these changes. And it's great that those individual faculties are working at it. But what I'm interested in as a department chair and a school leader um, and working towards this national kind of uh, stuff is that, you know, I want to see systemic change. How do we change our daily way of working with teaching? And how do we think about that? Uh, so a lot of this comes from our third pillar. We want to make sure that we have the same language to describe what we're seeing. So we use this great shock experience all the time on our campus. And every single one of our faculty members, whether in science or humanities and social sciences, have recognized that experience in their class for their students. So we do have this way of talking. Uh, we think carefully about our values, and we really want to not only our values, but understanding of our responsibility to pay back this educational debt. So it's not sufficient that we just think that we are good people but we are gonna do good actions to create good outcome for our students. And yes, you know, and when we understand our responsibility, we can counter the idea of, yes, this is gonna take more work. As faculty member, I'm probably doing more grading than I've ever seen before, but of the effects of what's happening for the students. And my students are coming back and telling me it is important. So, you know, we want to make sure that we are understanding what we're doing and get the student voices uh, in there. So we do a lot of sharing and talking about teaching at PCNJ, particularly in my department throughout the pandemic. We, we host faculty meetings that are completely dedicated to teaching and just about teaching. We spend the time to talk about what we're seeing in the classroom, what solutions we're doing. Um, this also translates to our school science meetings pre-pandemic. Uh, we've had a couple of leadership changes, so our, that's a little bit up in flux uh, right now. But we, we try to talk about this across departments. So it's not important just to talk in our department, but we have requirements in math and physics. So we should have conversations to those departments about what's going on there. So communication is key. And we do these in formal meetings and also informal brown bag lunches where we come in and talk about things like group work. Like what are the best ways? Uh, so if you look at the literature for group work, there is not a single consensus of what the best group dynamics are. That means we need to have a whole suite of group assignment solutions and, and how to adapt them for different uh, situations. And what's really important in these conversations is that we share successes and failures. Academics don't like talking about it. You know this as grad students. You know this in terms of faculty. We don't like to talk about all the, uh, the 30 experiments that didn't work. We just want to talk about the one that did. However, science is about and we need to make sure we ingrain that in our conversation and that these failures do not show up in odd places like tenure and promotion letters, which has happened to me. So these kinds of conversations come up and all of a sudden, you know, the, there were weird stuff that was getting written in the line, wasn't a full uh, on there. And yeah, it, so that creates like some weird situations that I put a stop to after I made full. Like, you cannot put that in there anymore. Um, and, and so, you know, how do we share about failure? And some departments have very different cultures on sharing failure on there because of these kind of weird places. It shows up in things like tenure and promotion. So, you know, we want to be able to talk about that. So we need to think carefully about our systems of oppression uh, when we're trying to work about things like teaching 
So I'm going to give you a quick, uh, well, not so quick. I'm going to give you an example of our experimentalism in action. So this is our chemistry 201. That's general chemistry. Um, and we developed this high structure guided practice classroom uh, in here. So we already know about our data that students that are taking chemistry and biology, they don't do so well because of math and other issues that's on there. Um, we know about grade shock. So we collected this holistic picture of our most marginalized students at the time, uh, which are mostly brown, uh, which were black and Latinx first generation college students. So we were focused on that group. Um, and then we tried to design interventions that we could unleash to everybody. Um, for the entire class to, to participate in. So we changed our pedagogy. So we talked about these kinds of things already. Um, and we, we really focused on, on this mechanistic viewpoint on here. So this is an example of one of our uh, reflections on here. We do things like learning objectives. We make sure students understand and connect learning objectives to problems on exams. We are not trying to surprise them. And students are used to being surprised. They're used to being, you know, you know, um, you know, fifty percent or sixty percent of the exam are these kind of reach questions on there, which is very challenging. They see that in high school all the time. They're expecting the same thing in college. So, you know, identifying your mistakes, thinking about what you could have done before the exam to prevent the mistakes, and it's not just study more. You know, be specific about this. We added, I added this section, write the section in your textbook that you will have to study and also look at the problems at the end of the chapter. For the first time in all my student feedback, I finally got students to recognize the textbook was important to my class by making them do this after they got a problem wrong. So just that little change, change your perception of how to use textbook. And I think that's even more important now when students don't even know what a textbook is. Um, and all of our textbook, we use OpenStax textbook, so it looks like a web page on there. So they're not making that quite connection in terms of uh, 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 an OpenStax textbook and, and like a physical book that I've been used to uh, on here. So this is an example. This is extraordinarily work intensive uh, for the faculty members. We have about 48 students in a general chemistry class. So it's manageable for, for my classroom. Not so manageable in a classroom of 200. <laughs> So what does this look like? You know, that's part of, you know, what you have to figure out in here. We want to have multiple interventions because learning is complex. So we sat down and analyzed all these cause effects mechanisms and designed all of these interventions in here. So this isn't designed for you to read every single one. It is designed to show you the breadth of this. Because if you actually want to make change and see effects to it, you're going to need multiple changes. But we do recognize that your time is limited. So having a plan on how you're implementing this many interventions is important. So you're not going to be able to, you may not be able to implement everything at once. I just did it because I felt it was important. And I was the one who piloted a lot of this uh, on here. But we, we grounded all of it in, time, in terms of lecture, or, or sorry, in terms of uh, fundamental um, um, education uh, pedagogy. Like things like reverse design or backwards design is critical uh, to this. That's where you start with your outcomes first. Like, what does my test question look like? And then you kind of address what am I doing in class uh, for them? And then what kind of practice spaces am I giving them? So, you know, you start with your test first and figure out what that alignment is. If you walk into any of our general chemistry, it looks like a flipped classroom. So we, and the only reason we call it, you know, the flipped classroom, it is not you know, all these interventions are not just a flipped classroom. So what we actually do is call this a high structure guided practice classroom. So we only use the flipping as a technique to buy us more time in the classroom so that we can work on the hardest thing for students, which is problem solving and trying to walk them through problems that they're going to approach. And those are aligned to what we're going to test them on. So we try to pull those through together. And what this actually looks like is, is more than just a flip. What we're doing is we're providing an active learning practice space where a student is allowed to make mistakes. So we know what the barriers are for them. The student needs to figure out how to sail over it. 
How do they figure out to do the, the problem solving so that they can get the problem right? And there, it's okay to keep hitting the barrier until they figure it out because we can tell them everything they need to do, but they just won't do it. It's very important, particularly for our Brown, Latinx, and queer students to be culturally responsive. At a minimum, don't be an asshole. And that's what we tell our faculty, like at a minimum, just don't do that. And then so we give them examples of what being an asshole actually looks like um, that have actually come up through things like Instagram. Like we have a black and PC and J Instagram. It's a little bit horrible what some of our black students are going through at our school. I'm sure there's one at NC State too. <laughs> so those conversations are already happening uh, in there. Um, we do a lot in terms of metacognition and fundamental skill building like study techniques that are college appropriate uh, in here. And then we also do quite a bit in assessment alignment, making sure our assessments are aligned to our classroom practices and all the practice problems that we give them. So making sure this is actually ridiculously important uh, for us. So one of the problems that we've had with students, uh, particularly um, in TCNJ chemistry, they don't understand how much work it takes for TCNJ chemistry course and all of our science courses. So first day of class, I tell them you need about 10 to 12 hours outside a week. Uh, classes at a uh, time outside of class to do well uh, on there. So that's pretty common for all of our STEM courses at TCNJ. It's a little bit different between institution and institution, but this is what it looks like. Most of our incoming students have told us they spend five hours a week studying on all of their classes in high school. So we're asking for like a huge increase. The students don't know what to do with this time. So let's go ahead and structure the time for them. At least in general chemistry one, we have something due every single day of the week for them to get them into the TCNJ culture of studying every day for their science course, science and math courses. So they have to do something. We use the, we utilize the power of our learning management system uh, to do all the stuff. So I can't tell you how many students sit there and go home every single weekend and do nothing while they're home. Well, that stops it when I put an assignment on Saturday. So, you know, and we give them some buffer room in case, you know, they do have to work. We do recognize them. But they should plan for that. Um, and planning helps with your mental health <laughs> kind of thing. So, um, and the last thing that we do is we share lots of our data on this high structure guided practice classroom uh, in here. And some of the data that, that we, um, we share are things that look like this. So we want to share our data because this is what speaks to our faculty. We actually did a pilot uh, of this course right before the pandemic. I remember giving this uh, talk at our faculty meeting the first week of March of 2020. And we all know what happened the second week of March. We all went remote. So this data came out and I showed it to my department. So we can actually look at DFW rates uh, over here, and this is a traditional kind of classroom. We can look at all students. Pell eligible has to do with their, their family income. Um, so that's pretty much a national marker of what their, um, their income is like. So if they're Pell eligible, they're typically from a lower income bracket, which goes back to that educational debt model uh, on here. And then the non-Pell eligible are the ones that actually have some money. They might be living in a, in a better school district, might not be, it kind of depends. Uh, we focused on white uh, students and black and Latinx students. We didn't have a lot of people in this data set, so we had to combine the black and Latinx uh, together. And you can see in all of our traditional classrooms, our black and Latinx students, they don't fare so well, particularly the Pell eligible uh, students. So this is the, you know, it's the same data I showed you in the first slide, exact same data. We go through and look at our high structure guided practice classroom. Does that data look different? It looks a lot different. Of all of our students, we couldn't tell the difference between the white and the black and black. Like I could no longer predict based on the color of somebody's skin, whether they would succeed or fail, which is ridiculously important. We our lowest income students, actually the black and Latin students slightly outperform our white students. So these white students probably came from under-resourced backgrounds. 
This one's a little bit more complicated because they all participate, most of these students participate in our summer program to help them get acclimated to TC and J. We knew about what we were going to do. One class, one workshop will not fix the problem. Faculty, stop saying that you need to just send them to the tutoring center. Stop saying that you just need this extra course for them to do well. It needs to be integrated into everything that we do on here. And it has to go through multiple courses. It can't just be in your first intro course. You have to see it uh, happen. So this is actually fascinating data. And now that post pandemic, we've actually looked at access to A and B in our classes. We have allowed our students from marginalized backgrounds to have more access to A's and B's. So this only looks at the negative stuff. You know, who's failing out? We want to create a sense of belonging. So we want to see who is actually thriving in our majors, seeing more access for Black and Latinx and first-generation college students to those A's and B's, which means they want to be in chemistry. They want to be in science majors longer uh, in here. So we were really happy with this data, um, and we're still analyzing it post-pandemic. It still looks pretty good uh, in here. So the fact that we are able to erase racial differences, not just you know, make it better, but erase them is ridiculously important uh, for us. So since we do do qualitative data uh, on here, everybody asks uh, this, there's a lot, people fight our class the first two weeks. They fight me hard because I am asking them to do more work than they've ever done for my one class than they've done ever before. So they don't know how to manage that. So, but however, we do collect some survey data. And this is some of the examples of the survey data that comes out. Before taking Chem 201, I preferred lecture heavy class, but I don't anymore. They found the value of what we're doing. And I talked to a few people before uh, about this. I am grateful for the experience because it helped me to understand that my success is in my hand and that I have to drive my own learning process forward the kind of comments that we want to create for our education, uh, you know, in our education system. We want college students and graduate students to be independent learners. And definitely by graduate school, you need to be an independent learner to be successful uh, at this place. So this is just some of the examples of some of the systemic things that we're seeing in our survey data, which is great because I have, you know, a sociology colleague and not only that, I actually analyzed this over multiple years. Over 90% of the students have positive experiences in Gen Chem. That's pretty good because most of the time they hate Gen Chem. It's just another class, it's another barrier. They cited strong development of college level study skills, increased confidence and self-efficacy. So they felt like their learning was in their path uh, on there. And this is even more important because we are getting actually fewer chem majors because of a demographic cliff that's happening in the Northeast. There was a major shift in the interest in studying more chemistry. So that's good for my department because I get more, I have signed more people into my chemistry department than I've ever seen before. Our department is actually growing, <laughs> um, you know, after they're taking a couple of these classes. So, you know, this major shift in interest is ridiculously important if we want to create more chemists and support um, uh, our department. I'm going to wrap this up um, just a little bit. So this wasn't just in general chemistry. My department, because we were going through this theory of change, we started seeing changes in almost every single one of our department courses, everything. And not just only, we started growing uh, the, the full-time faculty that bought into it and temporary faculty, which is very important for a lot of schools that have things like adjunct teaching, getting adjuncts to buy in on this kind of teaching strategy. And it, it started to translate into a lot of our other courses that are happening uh, throughout the curriculum um, in there. So it's not just this one course. I am trying to in, in an entire department and now that change is starting to spread throughout the school science and TCNJ by doing this sharing of data on here. So we're really proud of all of this work and, uh, and it takes a lot of people to do this work. So lots of folks, 
We do have a significant amount of funding from NSF and HHMI. However, everything I described here costs nothing to actually implement. All the money went to the social science study um, of all the data, data analysis uh, on here. But this is a lot of people at TCMJ that is doing this work um, uh, for us. So that is what I'm going to talk about um, at TCMJ. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on some of the other stuff that I do uh, and DEI uh, kind of work. So we work quite a bit. This is what one of our inclusive classrooms look like at TCMJ. Uh, you know, they're all working, they're all talking. This is an eight o'clock class. And they're all staying awake the entire class period. I've never seen that before. Um, you know, and I do a lot of workshop. This is Lynn and me uh, doing an inclusive pedagogy talk at TCNJ. We do a lot of undergraduate research. We go to a lot of conferences like SACA uh, to help, uh, you know, kind of spread what we're trying to do uh, for the work. Um, so those are kind of fun uh, to think about. We hosted the Mid-Atlantic Regional Meeting at TCMJ. Uh, we're right outside Trenton, New Jersey. This is the classic um, Washington crossing, uh, George Washington crossing the Delaware River. But you can see we changed who it is. And this is actually George Washington Carver uh, on there. So famous black chemist, ag chemist. Um, like, and this looks different what our revolution that we think is going to happen. Our revolution that we felt that was going to happen at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Reason, uh, regional Meeting was to think about chemistry and who is doing our chemistry and how important who we are is to what we're doing. So lots of different folks uh, doing this kind of work. Um, that was a lot of fun. I do quite a bit of work with the American Chemical Society Leadership Institute and the BRIDGE program. So the BRIDGE program is uh, designed for Black and Latinx uh, graduate students. So check that out. You can go to ACS. We do workshops uh, with you on career preparation. This is part of the team uh, that, I, uh, that I work with. And then I developed with uh, Amber Charlevoix with, and a bunch of other folks, the Science of Managing Inclusive and Diverse Team. So I have lots of uncomfortable conversations with lots of scientists uh, in there. And I'm quite used to doing that. I'm really, I really love pushing people's buttons. Um, to, and, and I pissed off a lot of people. So, uh, but I bring them back. I give them techniques to kind of uh, uh, work through that. Um, not only do we do this kind of work, we do lots of publications uh, in this, you know, thinking about how our theory of change works, think about marginalized students. This is one I'm particularly proud of, best practices in diversifying chemistry faculty. So it's about the job search. So come talk to me if you want to see some of the stuff that's doing. And I'm really, I really love thinking about teaching uh, in here. So there's, you know, there's book chapters that is thinking about inclusive excellence uh, in here. So I also work on the Committee of Professional Training. So this is the ACS guidelines for bachelor's degrees of approved programs. What I love about this is it's a systemic change based on policy change. So our new 2023 guidelines have all diversity, equity, inclusion items in there that all departments are gonna have to do to make sure they maintain their, their certification or their ability to give out approved degrees. Um, in there. So taking a national focus on, on you know, transforming uh, all these kinds of departments is important for us. And I want to just let this off that I am much more than a chemist um, in here and thinking about, you know, that I love what I do, but I know all of you are very diverse backgrounds. I have a, a, a very large extended queer family that we all hang out, we smoke cigars, we drink a lot. It's a lot of fun uh, and, and yeah. And then that part of our, our LGBTQ plus campground. Um, so I built all this um, out there and there's a bathroom back here that I'm in the process of building. So I do all of that kind of stuff. This is my dog Tater. This is a, a, COVID, in, uh, a COVID adoption. This is my grandson, Christian. Uh, he's awesome. Uh, and there's, you know, you know he, they, uh, he and his mother live not too far from us. Um, uh, working with them. So it's great to have him around. And I am also a big gamer. Um, uh, Elden Ring is, you know, I'm totally addicted. I'm about 200 hours into it. I'm still not the end. The one thing that I think about educational design is there's a concept of pleasantly frustrating 
<laughs> this game, Elden Ring, is pleasantly frustrating, and we reward success by beating that boss that took you, you know, 300 deaths on that. <laughs> Can we design our science curriculum to be pleasantly frustrating? And if we can design to be pleasantly frustrating, I think our students are actually going to enjoy the challenges. So we have lots to learn. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me today. And uh, I'm happy to have a chat with you. Any questions? I'll let you, I will, I will okay. call it. Yeah, absolutely. So we switched to pretty much open stacks textbooks for most of our chemistry courses. Uh, so general chemistry we use the open stacks uh, second edition of the Adams first uh, model. So we try to create that kind of equity and, and we provide that to students for free. Um, and then we purchase a learning management system, which is about $25 a semester. Um, and some places force you to package a whole year, but a lot of our students only need one semester. So we force them to to give us just one semester of it. So $25 for the class is not too bad compared to what I paid back in 1992 for my general chemistry textbook and lab manual. That was probably about $300 for the full year back in 1992. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I know the organic chemistry, I, our, our students were paying like $600 for the full year of the entire suite packaged together. So we try to go to OpenStax, not every single course will do that, but we try to use uh, free textbooks. But that creates other problems of those students not really recognizing it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Group work was, yep, group work is, is critical to our general chemistry classroom and almost all of our other general uh, chemistry courses. So we do that. And then things like randomizing, that's an excellent technique um, to move things around. There's some faculty that, you know, the extent of that randomization is different uh, for some faculty. I like to change up every single class period and make it part of the culture that you're going to work with somebody different every single um, but, you know, every faculty member will have a different strategy. You know, there's some research that shows if you put like a medium student with a lower student that helps to pull some of them up, putting a really strong student with a weak student doesn't do anything, but sometimes it does. <laughs> so it's hard to figure that one out because there's no one strategy. It depends on what that strong student, if they actually want to teach. If they want to teach, then it's really powerful. But if they don't want to teach, then it's actually worse uh, for that, that weaker student that isn't doing so hot. Thing I like issues. Thanks. Um, um, great shock. Thing. Um, can it not like uh, discourage students? Like, can it not have that like, like, so early? Um, yeah. So we design our courses to assume that they know nothing about chemistry before they walk in. So because that's what we saw in our most marginalized students, they had chemistry, and that was actually perfect for fall 2021 uh, and this past year because everybody had chemistry online. <laughs> So they didn't really learn anything. So we, we assume that they don't have that knowledge. Uh, we give math resources. Like we have a little module with math on there. Uh, for general chemistry one, it's not too big of a deal, but general chemistry two, there's actually a lot in terms of using things like um, uh, uh, quadratic formulas uh, and that stuff and all the kinetics kind of stuff, which we're gonna approach. So we try to bed, embed some modules for math support in there. So it's there available. We don't make everybody do it. So we do try to pitch this at a, a student that hasn't had any of this uh, before. And then we try to challenge the, the really strong students to help teach and make it a team effort there. So hopefully that gives the strongest students, the privileged students, uh, uh, something else that they can do. 
um, uh, to support the learning of the classroom. Um, through, uh, through the Providing this structure outside of the classroom mm -hmm. with the other time commitments the students are having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I do this with our chemistry majors. We actually grid out the entire week um, for them. Uh, and then they have to fill in exactly, you know, when are they going to study chemistry? When are they going to study their math class? When are they studying biology? And if you're not doing all of those every day, then it's not a good schedule. So we try to go with a, a planning, strategic planning model where we try to get the students to set goals for themselves um, and share them out because apparently if you share goals with other people, accountable uh, to do that and on that. So, you know, there's like a feedback loop. So we try to go with the strategic planning model to help them manage all of their time. And at least for chemistry, it's some of it's already dictated to them. They still need to pick out. Um, so there's this concept called the curve of forgetting. As soon as you walk out of a classroom, your knowledge drops exponentially. You all know that. To try to counteract that curve, I show it to them, is to study within 24 hours. In fact, it's even better if you study within a couple of hours of lecture. So trying to get them to do that is important. Um, and trying to think about, you know, what does the, the, the research actually say about learning uh, to help buy them into that? So that's one of the things we do is try to grid out all their activities. I can't do that for every single student, but we try to do that. Okay, so uh, how do you incorporate DEIJ impactfully? Yes, yeah, so that's a big challenge uh, for uh, departments. And I would have to say the biggest pitfall that I've seen is doing a lot of the performative activities. Um, there's a lot of performative activities that kind of happen. Um, and we've talked about that. Uh, in, in our curriculum design. So one of the things that our faculty want to do, want to make sure that we have, you know, black scientists in every one of our lectures or queer scientists or somebody like that. Ridiculously important, but if that's the only thing you're going to do, that is not it's only one intervention. So designing multiple interventions is usually the challenge uh, of that and finding what fits the culture and design of your department. So there's a scholarship of, of application uh, too. And you know we can use our scientific method to figure out what works best for each institution. So I don't want to dictate exactly what's there. You have to figure it out in there. They're uncomfortable discussion. You know, that we don't want to know, we, like none of us wanted to talk about how bad of a teacher we are. The data all shows it. I, I'm a department chair. Know which are the problematic faculty. I know exactly which one. They're also the ones that are fighting me the most. So it's it's usually the time that it takes that's really challenging. And sometimes I think as a faculty member, you're not given a lot of time to do the deep thinking that is required for something like this. So how we carve out that time and make it you know impactful and valued by the department. Um, you know, our department's very research active, so pitching it all as a research project was very helpful <laughs> um, uh, for our department to, to move forward. Is that, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, uh, and I got you now. A lot of the part of TAs. Yeah. Um, if you stand for a professor that says, they've been doing this for 30 years, their way works, um, if you're a TA, what is yeah, so that's great. Yeah, so I like to think about that in a concept called, and we talked about this at lunch, uh, locus of control. So you control the things that you have the most influence over. So things like student environment, student engagement, student belonging, culturally responsive um, components are all very, very, very helpful uh, for marginalized students. I feel like they're valued um, and belong in the class. So focusing on those kind of classroom affects is really important. And I think those are one of the areas you can work towards. Um, and linking students to resources as much as you can. 
you know, because there are resources. A lot of students are afraid to ask professors for resources, but they'll ask a TA or they'll ask, you know, another fellow student for resources. So making sure those are all available and very upfront in there. The only other suggestion is making very clear what expectations and helping them to, to go through what those expectations and what they look like. Sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So similar kind of questions, uh, strategies for teaching assistants. It is kind of really work. You know, as a teaching assistant, you don't always have a lot of control of what happens in the classroom because you're a teaching assistant. <laughs> uh, and then there's a power differential between you know what you're allowed to do and what you uh, can do. So I think really working through, uh, thinking carefully about your students and listening to them. Listening to them, start to gather data. You'll start to see systemic data when you all start to talk to each other, you know, kind of creating communities where you all want to help students and you can share with each other, you know, your different strategies, I think is very good. Uh, so that, you know, some of you are maybe learning what the, you know, uh, I'm guessing most of your undergraduates are local or like U.S. citizen. Does that sound about right? Yeah. So, you know, if you come from another, you know, I know there's a lot of international folks you probably need help understanding what the student perspective is in the United States. It's very different than in other countries. You know, we have a new faculty member that is from Colombia, uh, never educated in the U.S. system. It was a big transition for him to understand what the student experience is. So sitting around and talking about, you know, what the U.S. experience is in terms of education is very important. So you as a TA, if you're international, is really helpful to kind of come to an understanding of what the best support is. You can't just say, well, that's what we did back at home because that's not what their context is. It's very different. So understanding the students is really important. Right. Um, but I, I, I a lot of great stuff. Uh, and, and those who listen to me talk about teaching, we share a lot. And thank you uh, and agree with a lot of that. The question that I, I'd be interested in you reflecting on a little bit is how we use the language, even approach our ideas about the marginal, marginalized, underrepresented student. Um, I've actually taken to try to avoid they in my vocabulary when I talk to students, <laughs> they and them, because that's an us them kind of issue. Mm -hmm. They're my students. Yeah. I just used it, right? Students are my students, they're not a they. Um, and, and, and so helping address that. But when, when, when we approach some of these strategies, focus on looking at the statistics of marginalized students. We can't deny that they're real, that the statistics are real. But, and, 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 and when we're looking at how we approach underrepresented groups, the culturally responsive part, absolutely we need to pay attention mm -hmm. to the underrepresented groups and the don't be an asshole is the first rule is, I mean, that, that really needs to be the top. But how do we, how do we avoid programming in our language to not reinforce the mm -hmm. imposter syndrome? Yep. What I find is, right, the shock aspect goes for the entitled students at least as much yep. as the underrepresented students. Yep. But if we make these changes because of our language about the underrepresented student, are we not reinforcing that imposter syndrome that says, yeah, I'm under, underrepresented, or if we overuse the black brown language, mm -hmm. we build mm -hmm. the assumption that black brown means. Yeah, absolutely. Under the so so that, that's a great point. So what we go for is an intersectional model. Mm -hmm. So looking at, you know, multiple effects, multiple identities, you know, and a lot of common solutions. So a lot of the common solutions has to do with, with educational debt and the lack of preparation underfunding. That doesn't matter if you are from a white rural area that is underfunded, or if you're an urban area that's underfunded, it's very similar. And when we look at our SATs, a student like an SAT score, if they have a low enough SAT, it, it, they, they all bomb out. <laughs> so, you know, it's the same kinds of solution. So in our language, in our design with our students, we don't talk about, um, marginalized students, and that also helps with institutions that are in places like Florida, that they're not allowed to talk about this DEI kind of work uh, on there. 
So you talk about it in terms of student success, but you know, in terms of the faculty design, we are getting data from the marginalized student because that's the one population at TCNJ that we see the most different in there. And then what we do, instead of just saying the black and brown students get those interventions, unleash it to everybody so that we use a universal design principle. So that, and then that way in our pedagogy and when we interact with our students, we don't talk about, you know, it's because you're a black or brown student, we intervention. So do you have intentional language to fight that imposter syndrome? Right? Yes. So I, 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 could, I could slow resource twice. Yes. Yeah. Right? I suffer from imposter syndrome every freaking day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what language do you have in this process to fight that imposter syndrome? Yeah, so right? imposter syndrome comes up in so many different ways. Um, and a lot of it for us, we don't address it directly. So um, we try to focus that probably, like I think I work with that more with my junior level students than anything. Um, uh, you know, I talk, we have conversations about what imposter and, and what are the strategies? And you can just Google a lot of the strategies. There's a lot of discussion out there and let them discover what it is and if they're feeling it. Uh, and it also helps that, to know that, you know, I get imposter syndrome too. It's an extraordinary amount of imposter syndrome to come to an R1 institution and talk about my research here when I know the scope of it is not quite the extent of what happens here. So that's a lot of imposter syndrome that still happens. And, um, you know, and how do you navigate that? So that's one of the ways that we try to do it. We don't address it in general chemistry um, at all, but I try to do it towards the, the latter part of the curriculum. Are there some more questions? Great discussion. One more. So my colleague Lynn Gaisley did her postdoc studying biomedical um, biomedical graduate students, particularly um, um, at high end institutions. She was following. <laughs> something's complete. Uh, following uh, those students and their strategy. So I know she has worked on it. How much of this translate? I think a lot of it is being intentional in our design of what we expect from our students. What do we expect from our graduate students? And can we be more upfront about what those expectations are? And I think that's what I suffered from in terms of my graduate program. I didn't know what my expectations were. It's like, oh, I thought you just kind of did research for five or six years, and then you get out with a PhD. But there were actually things that I didn't know that I was uh, in there that, you know, to pass things like your, your what, what do you call, we call them oral exams, the mid-year evaluation, the prelims, you know, there are things you're supposed to do. It was not clear to me what those things I was supposed to do. So being very upfront with those expectations and what the success looks like uh, for students, I think is, is one of those transferable things. So being very upfront with what that looks like is very good uh, for lots of folks. I want to know where the bar is. <laughs> if you tell me where the bar is, I can get over it. Um, let me figure out how to get over it, but I can get over it. But just tell me what the bar is. All right. Well, let's thank you one more time. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.